There are over 15,000 species of wildflower in North America. Despite many centuries of human contact with Europe and Asia, most are native and found nowhere else in the world. Other species have been introduced from Europe and Asia and are now well established in the countryside. Some of these introduced species, though they might be superficially attractive and coveted by insects, can be highly invasive. Without competition, they can completely take over entire habitats, supplanting equally beautiful and highly useful native plants and reducing the genetic diversity that is essential for a healthy ecosystem. Through their habits and behavior, their history and lore. Their interaction with insects. Their response to a rapidly changing environment. even through their very names, plants enlighten and entertain us. These are the stories of our wildflowers.
One of the earliest flowers to bloom in northern latitudes is the Pasch flower, named because it may be seen during Passover and Easter. It is currently known scientifically by two names, Pulsatia patens and Anemone patens. The latter is apt given that Anemone means daughter of the wind. A cold, windy landscape emerging from the winter's snows is home to the pasch flower. A down of fine hair insulates it from the still brisk temperatures. Its open sepals, bright white on the inside, are shaped like a solar dish in order to concentrate the weak rays of the sun at the center where there are numerous white styles surrounded by as many yellow stamens. These are the sexual organs the stamens which produce pollen, and the styles which are fertilized by it. Although its range is from Texas to Canada, the pasque flower is mostly found on the open prairies of Canada and the northern U.S. The photo scan shows the light pink to lavender color of the sepal's outside surface and the fine hairs on the leaves and stem. In the pasque flower, the female structures mature before the male to avoid self-pollination. But self-pollination can nevertheless occur. Either way, the tower-fertilized styles will soon develop into the tufted fruit containing seeds which will be distributed by the strong springtime breezes. Bloodroot is another of the spring ephemerals, plants that flower only briefly in the spring before the forest canopy occludes the sun. Like the pasque flower, its petals are white, better to capture the fleeting spring rays. The flower is bisexual with numerous yellow male stamens surrounding a central style. The species can self-fertilize. Four of the eight petals actually start out as stamens, but change their form, morphing from stamens to petals in an unusual process called homeosis. Its leaves are thick and fleshy, protecting the flower from the cold. Bloodroot is easy to find in wooded areas of the East, Midwest, and Canada. The photo scan shows the golden stamens encrusted with pollen, the nectar guides along the petals, and the deeply veined leaves. Spots of red hint at the color of the roots when cut open, the bloodroot. By late spring, the seed pods have formed. Bloodroot enlists the help of ants, which gather the seeds for their nutritious appendages called aliosomes. The ants take the seeds underground where they may sprout. Many insects visit the bloodroot, including bees and the aptly named bee fly, a true fly masquerading as a bee. Minor bees detest the bee fly and try to convince it to go elsewhere. They, in particular, have a good reason to hate the bee fly. Watch this sequence closely and you will see why. 
The female bee fly has spotted the underground burrow of a minor bee. She is about to pitch her eggs into the bee's nest where they will mature and feed upon the bee's young. There. Let's watch that again in even slower motion. The bee fly winds up and makes the pitch. Right over home plate. No wonder the minor bees are so upset. But they seem at best only to annoy the bee fly, which soon returns to its feeding. <laughs>